Hello, um, this is Aria Gold. I'm just connecting with Ricky Cage, who's in Bangalore, um, a great musician, creator, and environmental advocate um, who has been amplifying the voice of people who are caring for Mother Earth as well as inspiring people with music for a long time. Um, we just jumped off of an Instagram live where I was asking him about stuff. Hi, I wanted to ask you about my Earth songs. Um, but, um, but hello, since we're starting over, um, hello, <laughs> good to be uh, chatting with you. Yeah. Um, I, I see you also, you have a nice show and tell, so you could do like a, um, prog rock two-handed keyboard. <laughs> too. And uh, didn't you start playing prog rock at one point? Like, weren't you in like a Emerson, Lake and Palmer type of band at one point in your life? Correct. I actually started off my uh, professional touring uh, career with a progressive rock band. Uh, the band was called Angel Dust. <laughs> so okay. I was not the front. Uh, I was not the front person of the band. I was uh, the keyboard player, as you can see. <laughs> yes. Well, that, that's a very. Uh, that's a. I have wonderful images in my head of the the keyboard player in prog rock in the back, like with the keyboards, like as far apart as possible you know, doing this. Like, no, but uh, during those days, I could only afford one keyboard. So I just had oh, one okay. of them and I would make do with it, even though okay. the dream was to have many of them. Uh, yeah. But uh, but yeah, uh, so we used to do, uh, we used to cover bands like Dream Theater and Rush and, uh, you know, and, uh, and we had, of course, a, a bunch of our own compositions that we would play. Uh -huh. I carried on in that band. Uh, when I joined that band, uh, the band was already about five or six years old. Uh, so I joined the band for the last two years of the band, and uh, 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 then I quit the band after two years, and that's when uh, the band uh, also, uh, you know, disbanded. And uh, you were the uh, last straw. I was the last straw, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so wait, what did you? Say? I, you know, I was a friend with Neil Peart, the drummer of Rush. Uh, did you say you you played with them, or you you? Oh no, no, we covered what? we covered music. You covered them. Rush. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Cool. Yeah. He he was in my uh, first feature film, actually. Oh wow! Okay, yeah. That, yeah. we were huge. I mean, I still am a huge fan of Russia. So, yeah. uh, so that's amazing. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, well, that's cool. That's a, a, another interesting connection we have. So, uh, we should jam out sometime to definitely to, to some <laughs> rock, rock. Yeah. Um, but so, I, I wanted to have you on my show and take an interview, which we will excerpt for the zine that we're bringing to Can because um, because of your leadership as an advocate. Um, and thank you for uh, <laughs> switching that word, meaning you're helping to amplify the voices of other people, which is really great, sure. but also inspiring people directly through your art, which is my goal in life as well. And so it's it's really cool to meet someone who's doing that through music. And so something like, you know, My Earth Songs, I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit about the the genesis of that project and and what how the reaction has been in making a a music for children that connects them with 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 my earth with our earth now, sure uh, so basically uh, uh by uh, with, uh, through my musical career i'm not actually a, a children's music artist and i don't make music yeah. for children normally uh, but then what happened was that after uh, creating music uh, for the environment and nature and uh, to create awareness on various problems like climate change I realized that what I'm trying to do essentially in my own small way and in my own tiny way is to actually create a more environmentally conscious society. And if one were to create a more environmentally conscious society, we have to start with the children. And there is no two ways about that. So that's when two close friends of mine, Lonnie Park from New York and uh, Dominic de Cruz from Bangalore, uh, uh, the three of us came together and created this project called As My Earth Songs. Uh, so the songs are uh, about sustainability, about environment, about uh, responsible living. Uh, you know, we've got uh, songs themed on poverty, on hunger, on, uh, you know, on education, on gender equality, on innovation, on, of course, climate action, uh, protecting life on land, protecting life underwater, all of this stuff. And, uh, but all the songs are extremely positive. All the songs are fun. Uh, it's not about doom and gloom. It's not about, uh, you know, shaming people into action. Yeah. It's, it's It's all about positivity and and also for us musicians, it was very difficult not to add any complexity into the music. So the music is as simple as it can be. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and music that can be learned on a single listening. And uh, we distributed the songs through the Indian uh, educational curriculum. 
so currently we are in about 11 million textbooks across India. And uh, we, uh, we are hoping to hit about 20 million textbooks by the end of this year and then double that up next year, go into about 40, 45 million textbooks next year, and then exponentially increase this over the next few years. Mm -hmm. So that is uh, what the plan is. And, uh, you know, and uh, the songs that we learned during our childhood are songs that we never forget. And yeah. if there are any morals in the songs, those morals dictate our lives forever. So yeah. that was I grew up, yeah, John yeah. Denver, who, who was a strong environmentalist, wrote songs that I was singing around campfires when I was, you know, six years old. And of course, now, I sing "Take Me Home, Country Road" or whatever, and I, I'm picturing a country road, and then knowing that a country road is important and that the trees are important, and you know, you're absolutely right. You know that the the influence of music on a on a child and and how they, and it, you know, Neil Peart from Rush had the same passion to to kind of make sure that children actually received a soulful education through music that then you know changes their lives positively. Absolutely. So that's great that you're doing that. And then you have, a, you know, you did an adult, essentially an adult version of that with uh, Shanti Samsara. Is that my getting no, that? That right? was a that that was an album which was done a while back. So yeah. Shanti Samsara is an album that I created in 2015. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was uh, uh, so basically after I had won the Grammy Award, my first one in 2015, um, our Prime Minister of India, that is Prime Minister Narendra Modi, he had invited me uh, for a meeting, and uh, during that time we discussed various things, um, especially about my environmental work and my work th with the United Nations as the Goodwill Ambassador. And uh, during that time, he mentioned that he's going to be visiting the Paris Climate Change Conference later that year, which we all know now is uh, one of the biggest conference of nations ever in the history of our world. And uh, with 193 world leaders coming together on a singular platform, uh, you know, to discuss about uh, how to mitigate the effects of climate change and how to create a future that is better for our future generations. Mm -hmm. And uh, so basically, Prime Minister Modi told me that he is going to be uh, delivering a keynote speech and he's going to have the main stage for a while. And uh, he's also going to be launching something known as a Solar Alliance during that time. The Solar Alliance, long story short, being uh, a group of uh, nations which have tropical climate, which can generate solar energy. And this solar energy can, uh, can uh, you know, uh, mitigate the use of uh, fossil fuels around the world and, uh, you know, and power uh, the, the so-called third world nations and the so-called global south. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so that is when both of us looked at each other and we realized that, okay, here's an opportunity to create some music. So that is when, uh, you know, he encouraged me to create an album, which has got musicians from around the world, uh, passionate musicians about, uh, you know, about climate action and about environmentalism. And, uh, you know, and I ended up creating the album Shanti Samsara with 500 musicians from 40 countries. Uh, countries all over the world, anywhere I could find a musician who felt as strongly as I did about the environment, I collaborated with them. Uh, there were also orchestras involved, there were ensembles from around the world and superstars from around the world. And then uh, the album was released at the Paris Climate Change Conference by our Prime Minister Narendra Modi and the French President at that time, François Hollande, and the United Nations Secretary General at that time, that is Ban Ki-moon. And uh, the album has gone on to becoming really successful all over the world. And I still perform songs from that album uh, 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 regularly in my concerts. And do you feel when you're playing a song from, from that album? I mean, my question always is somebody listening who's not necessarily thinking about these issues. I mean, of course, those of us who think about them think about them all the time. <laughs> you know, it's... Uh, you know, when you've become fully aware and nothing else is as important, but the average audience might not be thinking that when they come into a concert. Do you feel that you are able to change people in the course of a, you know, a 90 minute show where they come in with one soul and they leave with another soul? Absolutely. So there are two aspects to this. One is that uh, when it comes to concerts, especially or music in general, even recorded music, uh, one cannot uh, uh, remove their focus from the art itself. So the art itself has to be absolutely fantastic, number one. And number two is that it has to be very entertaining. Uh, yeah. Especially the concerts have to be super entertaining. So that is something that we do not lose focus of. Uh, that the concert has to be extremely engaging. It has to be extremely entertaining. Uh, very up-tempo. It has to, uh, we have to get everyone to sing along with us, everyone to dance along with us, irrespective of their thoughts on the environment, on their thoughts or the ideologies on climate change. And with every country, it's different since, like, for example, this year, we've done 
already done about nine countries and uh, we're going to be performing in another 13 or 14 by the end of this year. We've already been booked for those concerts. So with every country, it's different. Like, for example, in a country like India, where uh, climate change is uh, treated as an absolute science or in any European country um, or even any African nation. Unfortunately, in America, climate change is looked upon as something that you either believe in or you don't believe in, almost like a religion. Uh, you know, which um, and America is unique to this uh, particular issue uh, uh, rather than anywhere else in the world, uh, because in America, it's something that either you believe in or don't believe in, whereas in every other country in the world, it is treated as an absolute science with complete and absolute science, uh, scientific consensus. So uh, so one has to navigate concerts in America differently because uh, you uh, because it is always looked upon as a political uh, term, you know, climate change that, you know, that uh, if you believe in climate change, then you're a Democrat. If you do not believe in climate change, then you're a Re Republican. So uh, so that is why one has to navigate these issues very carefully uh, from country to country and figure out how do we get drop more people in rather than uh, drive people out or or alienate half of your population from your concert. So that becomes really important. Yeah. So and, uh, the word climate yeah. itself, I think, has been used as a wedge in this country where, like you say, the, you know, people believe it or not. Instead of I am always saying we should ch change the word to understand, because if you say do you understand climate change or do you not understand it, it makes it clear to people who who don't believe in it that it's just that they don't understand it. But um, but yeah, so I'd be curious to know how you navigate that, especially in the states where uh, there is this resistance to the facts around it. So the, the principles of mitigating the effects of climate change, that is responsible living, not subscribing to fast fashion, uh, reducing our consumption of meat, and then, uh, you know, and uh, uh, reducing our consumption of single use plastics and packaging and you know, and uh, responsible and uh, deliberate purchasing of uh, of uh, goods, you know, rather than just buying stuff and wasting it, not subscribing to the use and throw economy, uh, having a circular economy, reusing, uh, uh, you know, and upscaling items and things like that. So these are basic uh, things that uh, uh, of responsible living that one should practice irrespective of whether you believe or don't believe in climate change. So that's what we try to advocate through our concerts and uh, uh, through whatever we do, that it's all about individual action. Like, for example, with all the problems that we face in our world, whether it's climate change or whether it's species extinction or plastics pollution or air pollution or water pollution or whatever, I believe that the biggest threat to us as a species, uh, as a human species, is the constant thought that we have that somebody else will make a difference. Mm -hmm. You know, we're always waiting for governments, for intergovernmental bodies, for policymakers, for leaders, for corporations, for uh, uh, not-for-profits to actually make a difference when the truth is that the only way we can bring about meaningful change is if we change our own behavior. Because the thought that has been put into us through the education system and the way we've built our systems around us is that, you know, everyone's trying to change the world, but we very rarely talk about changing ourselves. And yeah. that's not because we are evil people. It's simply because we haven't empowered ourselves to believe that, that you know, that the, uh, that, the small incremental tiny changes that we can make within our own tiny capacities actually matter. So we have to first acknowledge and we have to empower ourselves to believe that we matter and whatever we do, whatever actions we take matter. And then once we understand fully that our actions have got consequences in our personal lives, then we will be able to bring about change. Uh, and I believe that music is that really powerful entity that can inspire people from uh, mere, from being merely aware of problems uh, to actually taking concrete actions within their own lives. So this transformation of awareness to action, that is what music can do because music uh, can reach people on an emotional level rather than, rather than scientific data and analytics and speeches. Music can reach people on an emotional level and I think that is why we need to harness the power of music to bring about change. I mean, you know, you, you said um, we need to change our behavior then you also talk about music changing the heart. I actually think personally, I uh, maybe have a slight disagreement with you about the behavior change. I think the change needs to be internal. And then the behavior behavior choices come out of the internal change. I think ultimately we, we probably do agree about that because especially in this country, you know, we do have this idea that the individual matters. In fact, maybe we lean into that idea too much in America. That's part of our mythology. But then what that causes in terms of environmental change is Americans are much more susceptible to 
the propaganda that says, for example, what's your carbon footprint? And the carbon footprint idea was come up with by an ad agency working for British Petroleum to try to pass the buck from BP, the corporation, onto the individual so that the individual thinks, okay, well, maybe, you know, if I turn the heat down in my house, that's enough, rather than, hey, the individuals need to change from within, but they no, also but that's, need to change the corporations and the government. No, but that that's, the but, that's not, but that's not exactly what carbon footprint is. Carbon footprint can also be the carbon footprint of a corporation, and carbon footprint can also be the carbon footprint of a nation itself. So carbon that, footprint does that, not exclusively accurate. mean, yeah, that because carbon accurate. footprint does not, yeah, because carbon footprint does not exclusively mean that uh, that it is for the individual. In fact, carbon footprint is very rarely used to describe the uh, uh, the impact that an individual has. Carbon footprint is more used for the impact that actually industry has and uh, the impact that actually a nation has. Uh, that is what carbon footprint. You're right. Is. Scientifically, you're right. But in terms of advertising and propaganda in this country, there's a lot of, you know, corporations that are trying to avoid making changes, um, saying things like at the end of the ad, make sure you reduce your carbon footprint. It's a way of, you know, passing the buck and, and abdicating responsibility. And scientifically, the, the corporations, the governments are, you know, measuring these things. But on an individual basis, people are you know, end up feeling like, okay, I can turn down the lights a little bit. And rather than I need to go speak to my governments to force British Petroleum to stop drilling or whatever. But, uh, but I would, uh, actually, I'm having a tough time agreeing with that simply because if British Petroleum asks you to reduce your carbon footprint, that's hitting the hammer on their own feet simply because, uh, you know, that means that they're asking you not to use their product because, Mm -hmm. uh, at an individual level, if you're reducing your carbon footprint, that means you're not using, uh, that means that you're asking yourself mm -hmm. not to use products that would actually affect the environment. Uh, because um, if you look at uh, uh, the 8 billion people who are on this planet, if you measure all of the 8, 8 billion people's carbon footprint on an individual basis, that is equal to the carbon footprint that an industry puts out. Right. Uh, be because at the end of the day, we are the consumers. So if you take it on a consumer level, as to what our carbon footprint is, that is the exact same carbon footprint as uh, as the corporations have, because the corporations are dealing with uh, their carbon footprint based on their sales, and right. the and the consumer is uh, basically measuring their carbon footprint based on their consumption. Yeah. So if you look at it, uh, uh, if you look at the net on both sides, they both will be exactly equal. Right. So uh, so that's what. So carbon footprint, I guess. Uh, it can be looked at from an individual level. It can be looked from, at from a corporation level. It's just a measurement, like how you would measure your financial statement or how you would measure. Um, it, it's just that, you know. So it's it's, it's just a simple uh, uh, it's just a simple measurement. Yeah. So, in your your view, if somebody is is changed by a, a concert, let's say, and they're activated and that they're connected to the soil through you know the magic of music in their heart that's going to naturally lead to them maybe hesitating to buy a plastic water bottle the next day. And then that, then their friend might see that and say, well, why are you getting a glass bottle or why are you using a purifier instead of, instead of a, another piece of plastic? That's your, you know, your sense of how best to change the world. Cause you know, we all kind of share our ideas here. Sometimes I just want to go in the street and yell at people, you know, but that doesn't work either. So, so uh, yes, uh, you know, uh, what you're saying is exactly true. So uh, basically, when it comes to the children's music, uh, like the Mayad songs that we had just described, uh, so we have an impact assessment where we have a couple of, uh, you know, of doctorate students who are measuring impact. So we get a lot of uh, messages from, uh, from the parents of kids who, uh, you know, who are exposed to these songs. And, uh, you know, and uh, the parents tell us that, how their children are, uh, you know, are forcing them at home uh, to go completely single-use plastic-free and to go packaging-free and things like that, you know, and and also try to, you know, sort of like, you know, for lack of a better way to explain, you know, shame their parents into action because children adopt uh, these uh, uh, environmental-friendly practices a lot faster, uh, mm -hmm. you know, than uh, than their parents. And also schools have constantly got in touch with us about how schools have gone single-use plastic-free, how's uh, how 
uh, you know, schools uh, are electrifying their entire, uh, you know, their entire, uh, uh, what do you call that, entourage of vehicles and stuff like that, and their entire fleets of vehicles, rather. And uh, also, there have been a couple of schools that have gotten back to us saying that they had a lot of open space, and they were planning to build buildings in that open space, and how uh, the children protested against it, saying that you cannot cut down trees, and, you know, and we need the open space, and, you know, and things like that. So it's been very, very encouraging. And when it comes to our concerts, Again, we've got a couple of doctorate students who help us out with impact assessment over there because it's important to figure out how impactful these concerts are and how, uh, you know, behavioral change is being brought about. So what they do is that uh, they actually meet people within the audience. They get a certain sample size from within the audience and uh, the willing members of the audience fill in questionnaires, very quick questionnaires online. And uh, what these uh, students do is that uh, these doctorate students who work with us do is that they keep in touch with these uh, individuals uh, for a period of uh, six months to about a year. And they figure out what all changes they've brought in within their life. So uh, and then what we do is that we do an impact measurement based on this. And then we figure out how we can course correct for the following years and what we can do differently. Wow. So the idea is that the concerts are very, very entertaining. The concerts are uh, and we do concerts for huge audiences, like, you know, we do stadium audiences. Uh, this year we performed our largest audience. This year was about 85,000 people um, in a concert. Uh, and we do even intimate concerts too. And uh, uh, the idea is that everybody is thoroughly entertained, but they've got something to think about uh, when they go back home. So that's the idea. Mm -hmm. um, I, it's amazing that you're able to measure that and that you're studying studying the impact on people's behavior afterwards because that's exactly the kind of uh, thing that one should be doing but it's incredible that you're able to be a creator on the uh, you know artistic and the side of soul and melody and and um and yet also seeing the the actual measurable impact afterwards i i can't say that i know anyone else who's doing that <laughs> so it's it's pretty pretty inspiring um thank you my project Fogtown is going to take a couple of years to make. And so I don't know if it's going to be something that I can measure as, as easily as that, but uh, you know, the ecological uh, consciousness is completely infused into this fictional story. So um, uh, I hope I will be as impactful in my own way. So uh, it's a big inspiration. Um, I noticed also you had Rosanna Arquette in, in one of your records, cause she did an interview with us. Uh, two weeks ago so she's going to be in the magazine as well so uh, excellent she's amazing both you guys next to each other <laughs> <laughs> so she's absolutely amazing so there was a yeah. song uh in uh, uh in the shanti samsara album the one which was launched at the climate change conference which i had mentioned about so there was a spoken word passage which uh, we had requested her to uh, recite uh so the song itself is uh uh is uh something uh, which comes out of uh, the vedas in india uh, which uh, so the the words of that song come out from the Vedas from India, which are the oldest uh, books known to humankind. And uh, so this these books talk about something known as Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam, which is a Sanskrit phrase, which literally means in English, uh, the world is one family. But of course, there's a lot lost in the translation. Now, when we speak about the world is one family, when we speak about coexistence, uh, the only thing that seems to come to our mind is living in peace between you know, Hindus, Muslims, Christians, Sikhs, Jews, uh, you know, uh, Jains, uh, uh, Buddhists, basically different parts of the human species or people across borders and things like that. Because somewhere along our journey of being humans, we've sort of forgotten that we are not the only species on this planet. We're just one among millions and millions of species on this planet. So not just our Indian uh, ancient culture, which is like many thousands of years old, uh, any ancient culture anywhere in the world, has always defined coexistence at its root as living in absolute peace and absolute harmony with every single entity on this planet, whether living or non-living. But we've lost that meaning today. You know, so we not only have to live in coexistence between all of us human beings, which we are not doing a very good job of right now, uh, but we also have to widen the circle and we have to live in peace and harmony with all life. That is a forest and wildlife. And not just that, we also have to live in peace and harmony with the elements of nature, that is the water we drink, the air we breathe, yeah. the land we walk on. And now we know through science that that uh, true coexistence and maintaining this delicate balance of nature is key to our survival as the human species. Because we keep talking about saving the planet. We keep talking about saving Earth or whatever. Yeah, that is absolute planet. nonsense. 
exactly exactly you said it right you know that it's all about saving ourselves because what we are doing is making a planet that is inhospitable for ourselves what we are doing with climate change what we are doing in global warming is creating a planet where we cannot survive yeah well the indigenous teachers that i've studied with here in the states obviously you know are very um integrated with the idea that all all the living and technically non-living things you know even uh rocks for example yeah we talk about in 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 um you know in sweat lodge ceremony the rocks that heat the sweat lodge are, are called the stone people and they are treated with the same respect that the people in the circle are treated yeah under more more respect because they're providing the heat um and this idea that everything on our planet all the material things living and, and technically non-living are part of our survival and part of our soul is across the world true in indigenous cultures so i you know i found this whether it was in south america or even in you know lithuania where there are people who are kind of reconnecting with old roots of religion there um and so we've forgot or many people have forgotten but the 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 learnings are still available to us if yeah. we listen to the right people and Absolutely. for the most part it's you know indigenous people who at this point you know land that is controlled by indigenous people is where 80 percent of the biodiversity that's left on the planet is in their hands and it's not a coincidence because they're living in harmony with it yeah and so we have a lot of things to learn from from these people you know these people absolutely are absolutely have you studied much with in indigenous groups uh, either in india or elsewhere a lot actually because i constantly collaborate with them on music mm -hmm. so uh, a lot of uh, the indigenous groups and the tribal groups especially in india have got songs that are, have been passed down orally from generation to generation so there's no script for it there's no uh, there's no written dialect for it it's uh, it's all about these uh, or, uh, passing on these traditions orally and uh, so i spend a lot of time with the tribal populations in india and uh, i learn these songs from them and i collaborate with them on music so some of this music is on uh, the internet it's on my youtube channel where mm -hmm. i actually interact with them and uh, also made a documentary called who is baul about a thousand year old tradition of uh, baul music in india baul is basically a a form of music uh, in the uh, in the northwestern part of india uh, where, uh, you know, where uh, uh, this group of people have uh, decided that, uh, had decided about a thousand or over a thousand years ago that their pathway to God is through music and not through a priest and not through a middle wow. person, you know. So that is what, and their songs are largely about nature and it's largely about how uh, nature is so abundant and uh, and uh, so forgiving and giving. Okay. that what, This music is is on your YouTube channel? Yes, it is. Okay, that, that I'm very curious to hear hear that. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> so one way, song that I can it. recommend is one song that I can recommend is the One with Earth song. It's on YouTube. It's a collaboration between me and uh, the tribal musicians of India. So, okay. uh, so yeah. So uh, I guess uh, it's that and a bunch of more that you could actually yeah. listen to. Yeah, you can send me some links that we'll put in the magazine too. Um, Wonderful. Um, so um, it does remind me a little bit of. You know there are elements of Sufism that have the idea of um, music being the pathway to God as well. I mean, you know, the like Qawwali music from Pakistan has a similar concept. Um, so uh, anyway, I really do want to <laughs> want to hear this. I want to hear it right now, but I'll, I'll wait. It'll it'll be what I listen to the rest of the day. I think. Um, so uh, maybe we'll sign off. Um, I am so inspired by everything you're saying. Um, we're going to condense this interview down into a digestible, readable thing on a page. Yes. And the video itself, uh, we're going to host it on the Fogtown webpage, and I'll also send it to you. So if you want to do anything with it, you know, it's yours. Fantastic. Well. Um, and uh, if you find yourself in France in a few weeks, um, come say hi. Oh, wonderful. I was actually just in France. I had uh, performed in Paris at the La Cien Musicale. This was uh, uh, this was on April uh, 11th that I performed there. It's such a oh, beautiful okay. venue. Yeah, beautiful yeah. hall yeah. Um, just on the river. So it was absolutely amazing. Yeah. Okay. So I'll be performing again in France uh, in July. In the first week of July, I'll be performing. Oh, okay. Where, where is that? On the, again, at the La Cien Musicale okay. on the 6th, on the 6th of July. Okay. Well, so I hope we will meet in person um, soon. Yeah. 
I can't even remember how we ended up connecting, but somehow we had each other's emails addresses, email addresses, and I don't think we've met in person. But, yeah, we haven't. <laughs> yeah. So I, I was like, I, I got an email from you, and I'm like, how did this happen? But uh, but it's it's wonderful. So you and you were... uh, in fact, last year I had uh, opened the Cannes Film Festival with a concert uh, because uh, last year the country of honor uh, for the Cannes Film Festival was India. Mm -hmm. So I was invited by the uh, by the Cannes Film Festival to actually open the uh, open the event with a uh, with a forty minute concert, and uh, and in fact it was the first time ever that the Cannes Film Festival in in its seventy five year history uh, that they uh, that they actually opened the festival with a concert. They, they've never had a concert there, so it was wow. a huge honor to actually do that. So we had the concert, and then immediately after our concert, there were these amazing fireworks which went off. And uh, and then the uh, and then the festival was declared open. Okay, well, so maybe I'll still be able to hear you echoing. Against <laughs> <it>. <laughs> but this year, unfortunately, I won't be able to make it because yeah. I've got okay. concerts during the time. But I, I absolutely love the festival. Okay, well, so um, thank you so much. I will I will send all this to you once it's been processed, and um, I appreciate everything you do. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And very kind of you to do this interview. Yeah. Okay. Ciao. All my best. Thank you. Bye-bye.